Mona, on the one hand, we've got this trade issue still hanging over us. On the other hand, some really positive initial jobless claims yeah. numbers. How's an investor to play it? Yeah, you know, I think what we are seeing this year is really the overhang from these geopolitical tensions weighing on the markets. And that's not in, only in the U.S. where we're getting day 34 of the government shutdown. It's also the China-U.S. trade deal. It's also Brexit in the background. But what's really kind of the fundamental driver, the earnings, has been actually positive. So it's impressive to me that uh, despite the fact that we're in the longest shutdown in history, the S&P is actually up about 10 and percent, the best performance historically during any shutdown period. Now, of course, we're coming off of December where we were down, peaked to trough about 20 percent on the S&P. So, of course, some of this is a technical, perhaps a rebound uh, off of overdone levels. But despite that, you know, we're getting solid earnings results. And we, if we can get any resolution from either the government shutdown, uh, trade, or perhaps globally, Brexit, et cetera, uh, that could really spur a next rally upward. So that's what we're hopeful for. So, Sean, what's an investor to pay attention to? The, these earnings numbers, fundamentally, some of the tone uh, about how these uh, geopolitical risks are affecting the companies? What? I, I, I certainly think projections going forward. So you look at the chip sector today. Mm -hmm. TI had a good uh, announcement. Lamb had a good announcement. All of a sudden, they're up big. I mean, this is a trader's market as well, right? You have to make sure that you're taking your, your chips off the table at some points in time because, in reality, your, your total return on a yearly basis is not going to be projected out, you know, that 15% return, you know, every month. You're talking about, you know, mid single digit kind of returns for the equity market this year. Credit market's going to have some issues. So I think you're supposed to look at what's going on right here and now and but also take a look at the projections going forward and make sure that you're you're allocating your money correctly because that's going to be the key to making money going forward. Just to put a finer point on that in terms of looking at it from right here and now based on everything we know about earnings right here and now and looking out into this year with all of the uncertainties from a macro level playing out are stocks still too expensive? I think they are okay as of right now because the Fed is on hold, right? And that's the projection. That's why the market rallied. Fed is on hold, all of a sudden risk comes back on. This is a risk on, risk off market still. So and with high volatility, that's also associated with it. So right now they look okay. I think in the second half of this year, certainly going into 2020, they don't look okay. Mona, your thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, I think um, we came into the year actually at a year-on-year -year EPS growth estimate of almost 12%. That's been ratcheted down to 8%, and now we're closer to a 6% year-on-year S&P growth figure for this year. I think that's more in line with realistic expectations. Our own internal numbers look at 4 to 6%, so perhaps a couple percentages on percentage points on the downside. But if if markets are pricing that in, I think we are getting to a point where perhaps they've priced in the negative expectations. This is, of course, barring any shocks uh, from any of the events we talked about earlier. So how are you feeling about financials outpacing Fang? Sort of the inverse of what we talked about late last year. Yeah, I, I think that financials look okay because their multiples are relatively low. We still have a flat yield curve, which is a problem. Loan losses aren't an issue as of right now. So I, I think, again, they look okay. You want to be in places where balance sheets are strong. You know, certainly the banks are not levered that much anymore, right? So they used to be levered 25, 30 times. Now they're levered, you know, eight or nine, right? So that's certainly helping. But I, I do think you're supposed to look at the world from the perspective of, where are we going in the next 12 to 18 months? And certainly, I think the consumer, which is really the one who's leading the marketplace at this point in time, yeah. is the inverse of what it was in the last cycle. The, the consumer was highly levered last time, right? And they were the ones who blew up. Right now, look at the companies and corporations are the highly levered ones, and the governments are highly <laughs> levered. And that's the problem. Yeah. Well, let's talk about geography a, a bit. You see opportunity in China mm -hmm. and emerging markets. Mm -hmm. You say yeah. the U.S. is still, yeah. in terms of developed markets, yeah. uh, strongest. What about Europe yeah. and, and this Brexit thing playing out? Yeah, you know, so what we typically talk about globally is kind of a barbell approach. So on one hand of that barbell is the U.S., still probably the best on the block from a developed market perspective. Uh, parts of China and selective EM on the other hand of that barbell, especially if we get a resolution in trade, but also if we see some softening or stabilization in the dollar. Uh, but in the middle there, in no man's land, is Europe. 
And I think partly, you know, we're looking for that resolution in Brexit, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. We got weak numbers just this morning out of Europe. Um, we're seeing downside to growth risks there. And on top of that, you know, I think valuations, while attractive, there are some value traps still in Europe. So what we do say to investors, longer term, Europe does become interesting from a dividend perspective. So we do see, you know, the Euro stocks, for example, is about 4% dividend. The, the uh, FTSE is, is even higher than that compared to a 2% dividend yield here in the U.S. So at some point we get, um, I think, interesting opportunities in Europe, but we're not there yet. And hopefully by, by mid-year we are there. So. Sean, I want to go back to the point you just made about companies and governments being highly levered right now. Is, is that a bubble? Is that the next potential cause of a recession? I, I think so. So if you look at the next three years, there's about $2 trillion that has to roll in corporation debt. That used to be about eight or nine hundred billion. So is the, have the economy has grown over two times in the last four or five years to justify the amount of leverage that's been put in place. And why did equity prices go up? Because CFOs and CEOs borrowed money really cheaply and bought back their stock. So amazingly, earnings went up because there were less shares that were there. So it's a numerator denominator game. And I think that is the next bubble that's going to occur sometime in 2020. E even if there is no more hikes, even if there are cuts? I, I don't think it matters because you still have to roll that debt. So we've been in an artificially low world with really tight spreads, but eventually people start looking at coverage ratios and what's going on, and that's going to be the problem. Mm. What do you think, Mona? Should investors be steering clear of credit right now? You know, I think we, I agree with Sean to some extent that um, the credit crisis may be the next crisis to come, but I think we're a bit early, actually. Uh, because we don't forecast a recession over the next 12 months, the risk of a default cycle really popping up on us has lessened. And given the fact that the U.S. Uh, numbers actually are pretty stable, we think we're, we're okay for now. And so we are okay taking credit risks. We have become more defensive. We think fixed income is a great place to remain active. Some of the passive ETFs that have come up in high yield in particular that are offering daily liquidity are a bit uh, worrisome from an investor perspective. So we, we think higher quality, a little bit more defensive, a little bit more active, but we can still take fixed income risk.